Praise the Lord, everybody. Pastor Fields here, and yes, it's Wednesday evening, and we're here again. Thank God we're able to come together again another week to go into the Word of God and to fellowship with one another. And I, I say it all the time. I say it again. I look forward to this time that we spend together in the Word of God. It's been a difficult week for some, so much is going on, but yet the Lord is keeping us, and I can say like the prophet who said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we have not been consumed, his compassions faileth not. Yet they are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Yes, we serve a faithful God. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful once again you have allowed us to come together for the purpose of going into your word. And Lord, we, we will continue to go into your word so your word can go into us. Help us, O oh God, as we feast on your word. Touch our hearts and minds, Lord. Give us understanding. Minister to our hearts. Minister to our spirits, Lord. So many are going through. We need your word. Speak, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us, the saints of God here at Greater Refuge Temple in Washington, D.C., and of course our sister church in the Bronx Refuge Temple Annex. Thank you for tuning in. And those of you who every week connect with us as we go into the word of the Lord, we enjoy this fellowship. And my only regret is that I cannot see you face to face but unable to embrace. Uh, but the Lord is amazing. In the midst of this pandemic, he's using technology to keep us together, to keep us connected. I, I want to talk on tonight, and, and my, my topic tonight is um, from a pastor's heart. And, you know, these are the last days, and the church is going through so much, yes, uh, in the midst of all of this, uh, many of the saints are frustrated. Many of the people of God, believe it or not, are going through discouragement. So much is happening, and I, I just want to share from a pastor's heart. I'm going to be coming from two passages of Scripture, and you'll understand where I'm coming from uh, in a few moments. Uh, the two Scriptures that we're going to read from uh, Acts chapter 11 verses 19 through 26 and then I'll go into the actual anchor scripture for our lesson found in the book of Colossians uh, chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. First let me read out the book of Acts chapter 9 I'm sorry chapter 11 beginning at verses 19 through 26 and you know the book of Acts talks about the falling of the Holy Ghost and the growth of the church. It also deals with the fact that the church went through much persecution. Listen to these words. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen or Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed, and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. They sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, where to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So we see the church was growing and the church was also suffering persecution. 
And the term Christian was given to us by those who opposed the church. That's how that term first came about, uh, persecution. And they would say, there goes, those, there goes those Christians, those crazy folk, those folks that always talking about Jesus. Uh, our actual tag name, as I should say, we were called people of the way. Uh, but the term Christian really was first given to us in Antioch. And you see, you heard a little bit about how they were scattered. Uh, Stephen was persecuted. As a matter of fact, Stephen was stoned. And Saul, that man Saul, who is later turned, his name is turned to Paul. And we learned last week when God changes your name, it means he's getting ready to bring you into a new reality. Um, so the church is persecuted. Stephen is murdered. He's stoned to death. It was Saul. One scripture says that held the coats of those that stoned Stephen. Uh, Luke writes the book of Acts, and he writes these words, uh, persecution, death, uh, people were dying. Listen, it, it was a lot different. Today, people leave the church because somebody talked about them or looked at them the wrong way. Uh, but this is some real stuff. They were being stoned. They were being murdered. And Stephen is the first martyr of that early church. Didn't want him talking about Jesus anymore. Uh, but here is our anchor scripture, uh, which was written to the Colossian church, written by that same man who used to be Saul. Now his name is Paul, and he's ministering to the people of God. Uh, and once again, of course, uh, there was persecution, there was trouble, uh, and trouble doesn't always have the same face. Uh, it's not always the same kind of thing, but it's still trouble, it's still persecution, it's still a threat. Uh, so Paul now is talking from his heart to the church. He's speaking to them, and that's what I want to do, and that's the name of my uh, lesson tonight from a pastor's heart. Uh, and I want to read you a few verses and understand the church is still going through, there's still persecution, there's still trouble. Uh, and in the midst of all of this, the pastor's job is to make sure that the children of God are prepared. Prepared, uh, not just prepared for the blessing, but prepared for the trouble that's going to come. Most of all, prepared to meet Jesus when he cracks the sky. But this is what Paul writes uh, to the Colossian church, second chapter, verses one through five. This is the anchor scripture. He says, for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So we understand now Paul had never seen the members of this particular church. Uh, he had never seen the Christians uh, that were in Laodicea or Coloss face to face. He admits this in his writings, yet he's writing to them of his deep concern for their spiritual welfare. It becomes a burden and every pastor uh, who loves the people of God will have a burden for the sheep that he's pastors. Uh, he had a heavy burden for their spiritual welfare and a burden was upon their heart for their eternal well-being. I want, I want the people that I pastor to make it in. I want to make it in uh, and I want the children that I minister to, the, the sheep that I'm pastoring, I want them to make it in. Uh, Colossians 2 and one, <clears throat> for I would that ye knew what great conflict uh, I have for you and for them at Laodicea. So he said, I, I have a burden for you 
the Lord has been dealing with me concerning the church in Laodicea and those of you here in Colossus. Uh, as for many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So what the pastor is doing, Paul, right now is getting ready to unveil his heart. And getting ready to speak from his heart to let them know of his burden concerning their spiritual maturity, their growth, their spiritual welfare. Uh, and I believe Paul here uh, and his whole ministry really is a model uh, that every minister, every pastor, uh, including myself, every leader, everybody that works in the ministry, anyone that's working in the Lord's vineyard, this is a perfect model of the fact that we should have a burden for the souls. We should have a burden for those that we minister to, burden for those that, we are, that we're working for the Lord for. And, I, and I, I said it just that way, I'm working for the Lord, but I'm here to be a blessing to the people that God has put me in the midst of. And, and every leader should have that burden. Uh, it's, a, it's an example that we can never hope to equal. I'll be the first to admit that, uh, but I'm striving for it. I'm, I'm seeking for it to be that pastor or to be that individual in the kingdom that God can use to be a blessing to others. Uh, and that will, I will always have that burden uh, for the souls of those uh, that I minister to, those who are working in the vineyard also, that they make it in, that they make it in, right? Colossians 2 verses one through five, uh, we are told about seven things in this particular verse. And we already know from reading Acts, uh, trouble has arisen. This is the beginning of the persecution. Stephen is murdered, right? Uh, in the midst of all of that, God is still building his church in the midst. And I want you to know, uh, and even your enemies need to know, in the midst of what the enemy is doing, God's church is going to thrive. In the midst of what the enemy is doing against you, because of what God is doing in your life, you are going to thrive. Yes, you are. The devil is a liar. Regardless of what's going on, persecution is like fertilizer to the church of God. Hallelujah. Yes, it is. The more you go through, the stronger God is going to make you. All things work together. For the good of them that love the Lord and for those who are called according to his purpose. There are seven things I'm going to discuss right here in this anchor scripture that we're using for our lesson tonight. And again, the subject of my lesson is from a pastor's heart. Uh, he talks about his conflict. I have a conflict. Verse 1, chapter 2, for I would that ye knew what great conflict uh, and in the Greek, the word is pronounced agon, agon, and it means a struggle or a battle or a trial. I'm struggling, I'm burdened, I'm, I'm wrestling with this, I'm, I'm concerned about your spiritual growth, your maturity, and I'm, I'm concerned about you making it in. Uh, and he talks to them from, from his heart, I want you to make it in, I'm, I'm struggling uh, with this burden, concerning Coloss and Laodicea. Uh, it, it was not primarily physical, but it was a spiritual battle. He is enduring uh, the process of intercession. Put that in the comment uh, section, hashtag intercession. He said, I, I, I can't see you face to face, uh, and I, I don't know when I'm gonna be able to get through Coloss or Laodicea, but I am praying, I've got this burden, I'm concerned about you. Um, it was not primarily physical, but it was spiritual, and it was mental, and it was emotional. Uh, it had him tied up in a knot, I'm concerned about that. Have you, have you ever been so concerned about someone in the kingdom until you couldn't sleep? Uh, you, you just couldn't rest, you had to pray. You're calling their name out in prayer constantly. Some of us are, have been doing it for our children. Some of you have been doing it for people in the church. It's, it's a burden. That's, that's a spirit of intercession uh, where, where it's, it's 
piercing your heart. You don't want them to fail. You want them to make it. You're concerned. You're not a busybody. You, you are concerned about their spiritual progress and maturity. And Paul is speaking from his heart. I'm, I have this conflict. I have this burden. I have this struggle uh, concerning Laodicea and Colossus. Uh, and what's happening is he's been issued uh, a certain, and I don't know the exact word that I could use, but it's a certain volume of intercessory ministry that has, that has come into his soul where he feels this, 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 this nudge, this push, this compelling, I should say, to call their names out in prayer, to go to war for them. My God, thank you, Holy Ghost. And, and sometimes uh, the pastor is not just there to preach to you. The pastor is not just there uh, to make you shout and make you feel good. But there are days where uh, that pastor is burdened concerning your soul, concerning your maturity, concerning your growth, concerning you making it in. That's what shepherds do. Uh, and, and I want you to know it's not just shepherds that have this burden. We're people of God who are sensitive in the spirit. Uh, sometimes you'll find yourself praying for people you don't even know. Paul said, I've never seen you. Yes, I'm your pastor. You've never seen me face to face, uh, but I have this burden. I have this conflict. Uh, so I have in my notes, Paul's conflict was a burden of spiritual desire for the blessing of the Lord to rest upon those who had been converted through his ministry. Uh, he had been entrusted with them, and he wanted them to be blessed. I want you to be strengthened. I want you to be totally and completely whole, and I want you to make it in. Hallelujah. So I have in my notes, listen, such conflict, of course, it does affect the body. It does affect the mind. It does affect your sleep because you have this, this zeal to see people blessed. Have you ever been there? Hallelujah. If you've ever been there, put it hashtag, I've been there too, Pastor, where you just have this burden to pray for people. I just, Lord, help them. Help, Lord, bless them. Lord, do something for them. Uh, and listen, Paul, the reason why Paul couldn't make it, and it, and it seems to be his testimony quite a bit now, uh, he's, he's being held against his will. He's, he's in bondage. Uh, he's, he's in Listen, he's, he's in a rented house. Yes, let's, let's read Acts. Let's read Acts. And what we're dealing with now is the nature of the conflict. This is, this is why. So put number one, the nature of the conflict. This is the first thing we learn. And, and I'm taking you to Acts chapter 28, verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Hallelujah. Two years, he's in his house. He's in a rented house, right? And doubtless to say that while he's in this house for two years, the guards heard him pray. Listen, the guards heard him pray. His situation did not hinder him from praying for the people of God, the guards, his enemies, heard him pray. I'm going to say that one more time because I feel it in my spirit. Paul is being held captive. He's in a rented house for two years, and no doubt the guards heard him pray, praying for the people of God, praying that they make it praying that they remain strong, praying that they don't let go of their faith. And you better believe he even prayed for those who were watching over him, the guards. And, and history will tell, uh, not only history, but the word of God will speak to the fact that those who were there to, to hold him or to render some kind of harm because of his life, because of his prayer, because of his praise, those who were there to hold him or to keep them. Remember the jailer? They were... Uh, recipients of his word or his love or his praise, I should say, the results of his life or his message or his praise would be the fruit of salvation. There were those who received their salvation, like the jailer. 
not just him, but his whole house, the book of Acts says, the whole house was blessed. The whole house was saved. So I'm going to stop right here for a little infomercial. You can't afford to stop praying for people, even uh, in the midst of opposition. You got to keep on praying. Hallelujah. Keep on holding on. Use that burden you have for prayer to continue laying on your face, standing in between uh, the enemies of their life, calling their names out. Even if you don't know their names and God just puts their face in your spirit, Lord, help him. Lord, help her. Uh, right? So not, not only was he praying, but we know from this and we know from his history that even the soldiers had to hear Paul praying for the saints of God. Right? Uh, they saw him pray, I have in my notes, and as he lifted his arms towards heaven, uh, his whole being may have trembled as he poured forth his petitions. Hallelujah. Have you ever prayed until, until you trembled, until you sweated? Uh, have you ever prayed until you've cried for people? Lord, help him. Lord, deliver them. Uh, Lord, touch them. Lord, they need you. That's what intercession is all about. So the nature of his conflict was that of intercession. He's praying for their maturity. He's praying for their strength, praying that nothing pulls them away from their faith. I want them to remain in the body. I want them to remain faithful to you, Lord, so they can receive everything that you have in store for them. And that should be the prayer of every leader in the kingdom, whoever's under you, whoever, even whoever's working with you, whoever's in the kingdom with you, whoever, hallelujah, pray for their strength. Pray that the Lord holds them and keeps them. Pray that their faith does not fail. So the intensity of the conflict is the second thing that we learn about right here in our foundational scripture. Colossians, the second chapter, verses one through five. Uh, Paul calls it a great conflict a great conflict. He calls it a great conflict. Uh, and it suggests, I have in my notes, the idea of intensity. Uh, it's a prayer that filled his heart and his mind, uh, so much so until it became a burden to him. I, I've got to pray. The only, way I can, the only way I can get some sleep is to pray it out. Lord, they need you. Lord, uh, I, I don't want anything. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, you may not even know all of the information. You may not even know the specifics of what you're praying for. It's just on my heart heavy. It's in me heavy to pray. I don't even want to eat until I pray this thing out. Lord, save her. Lord, strengthen him. Lord, do this. Lord, do that for them. You're not praying for yourself. You're interceding for someone else. And this is what was happening to Paul. I've, I've got to speak from my heart. I've got this conflict concerning the Colossian church and those who are in Laodicea. I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 26, where Paul says, and, and let's compare these verses, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 26, and then I'm going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and 12, and then Hebrews 12 and 1. And listen to what I'm reading. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 26, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. It's talking to the Corinthian church. Don't stop running a race. And don't worry about how fast others are running. Don't worry about what other people are doing. You run that you may obtain the prize. I'm not trying to beat nobody. I'm not trying to be better than nobody. I'm just trying to be the best that I can be and make it in. And that should be your, your determination also. First Timothy 6 and 12, Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So in one scripture, he's saying, run this race. Keep running till you cross the finish line. And here he's saying, listen, you got to fight the good fight. It's a race. It's a fight. You got to stay in it. 
You can't let go of it. Hebrews 12 and 1, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So Paul is used to encouraging. He's used to telling people you got to stick with it. You got to stay with it. But here in Colossae he said it has become a burden. Perhaps many were letting go. Perhaps some were laying down their faith. Some were walking away. Some perhaps were backsliding. Uh, and, and Paul has this burden in him uh, where it is an intensity. This conflict it has intensified because things are going on among the brothers and sisters. Uh, so the word conflict, it signifies a struggle. I am struggling in my spirit concerning my brothers and concerning my sisters. Uh, and it suggests the fact that he's struggling suggests that there were obstacles that were in the way. There were things, there were hindering things, there were blocking things, and that's what intercession is all about. Uh, I, 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 we're not just concerned about the clapping and the singing and the shouting, but there are some things the brothers and sisters are going through and somebody's got to pray, somebody's got to lay on their face, somebody in the kingdom should have a burden, such a burden where you're crying out to the Lord, Lord, they need a release, Lord, Listen, somebody prayed for me. Yes, they did. Uh, and you better believe there are people in the kingdom uh, that are praying for brothers and sisters. There are pastors who are not just willing to get in the pulpit and preach to you, but uh, they are laying before the Lord, calling, I thank God, for William L. Bonner uh, and his lifestyle of prayer, always laying on his face, always crying out to the Lord, and many times he was not praying for himself. He was praying for the people of God. Uh, that's what Paul is saying. I have a burden. I'm struggling. Uh, I, I'm, there's a conflict in my spirit. My brothers, the brothers and sisters, the people of God are going through. Uh, there are obstacles. There are things. There are burdens. He says to the Ephesian church, he says, uh, we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And if I take you back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, Paul says this, we're unto, I also labor, striving according to his working that worketh in me mightily. So he's saying there's something working in me, something that's dealing with me, that's, that's making me get on my knees and go to warfare, not just for myself, but for the others in the kingdom that are, that are going through all of these things. Listen, the enemy is attacking the church. He is attacking the people of God. And, and we don't have time to fight one another. If we're going to fight, we're going to have to start fighting on our knees. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Put that in the comment section. Hashtag, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What are we wrestling against? We're wrestling against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul said, I got this burden. The saints are going through. I got this burden. People are letting go. The enemy has tricked some. The enemy, the enemy has pulled some out. And I, I need to pray. Hallelujah. Pray in such a way where, where and ask the Lord to reach out and, and start pulling some of them back in. Pray for their minds. Pray for their hearts. Hallelujah. Pray that they don't give up. Pray that they will hold on to God's unchanging hand. Listen, I know there's a whole lot going on and, and there's a whole lot of struggling. There's a whole lot of, of stuff that's happening in the lives of the people of God uh, and we're going to have to intercede. We're going to have to intercede and Paul is speaking from his heart. I've got this burden. I've got this conflict and the subjects that brings me to the subjects of his conflict. We talk about the fact that there was intensity. We talked about the fact Yes, that uh, there was a nature of the conflict, the intensity of the conflict. And now 
we have to deal with the subjects of the conflict. Let's go back to um, verse number one. He says, I, I have this conflict concerning the, 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 and I'm paraphrasing, the Laodiceans and those who are here in Coloss. Uh, and I have in my notes, it is important to notice that Paul is not speaking of a concern for the unsaved. Yes, and, and there were times we said, I want people to be saved. I want them to be delivered. But this prayer, this burden that he had in his heart, in his spirit, was not for the unsaved. It was for the saved. Uh, even, I would dare say, for the babes in Christ, those who are, who are babes in Christ, who are struggling with what they see and what they feel and what's happening in the world or what's happening and so his, his burden was not so much, or it was not for the unsaved, but it was for the saved. Those who needed to grow in maturity, those who needed to, to, to grow up in God, to, to, to get some strength in their bones because uh, of trouble, because of turmoil, because of the trickery, trickery I should say, of the enemy. Uh, and these were the, the subjects of the conflict, I should say. Colossians 1 and 28. This is what Paul says, whom we preach warning every man. He said, we don't just preach to make you shout. I'm not, I'm not just writing this to tickle your fancy, to make you feel good, or to make people run around the church. I'm, he said, we preach warning every man and teaching every man and all wisdom that we may present every man perfect unto Christ. He said, this is, this is the subject or the, the, yeah, the subject of my conflict uh, that, that we, we preach and warn those who need to pull it up. Tell those you need, you need to shake it off. You need to pull it up uh, and, and to teach every man and to give you that wisdom, to put that knowledge into you or to give you that word that you need uh, because we have to give an account. Paul said I, I, the preacher has to give an account for the souls that have been laid in his charge that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. This is why we do it. Paul undoubtedly had a passion. Yes, when you read and follow his life, he did have a passion uh, for the salvation of sinners. He did. Romans 10 and 12. Uh, that's what that's all about Romans 10 and 12 for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God though not according to knowledge for they being ignorant ignorant of God's righteousness and doing and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God uh, Paul is saying I have a burden for the saints as well uh, the saints that are turning away. And, and to the Roman church, uh, he's dealing with the fact that they've turned, they got people that are turning away from the truth in the church. So he had a heavy burden. He said, I, I don't want that to continue to happen. I want you to hold on. Uh, and, and he's mindful of the fact that some of the people that were turning away have been in church for a while. And all of a sudden, they're giving up and I'm concerned about the babes who are watching these people turn away from God, giving up, saying, I can't hold on anymore. He's saying, I'm praying for you. His concern was for the sanctification of the saints. His concern was that they that are saved will stay saved. He was concerned that those who were being bruised and pushed and persecuted, those who were dealing with trials, would not succumb to the pressure of the problem, hallelujah, but would use the burden and the pain and use it as a sharpening of their praise and bring a deeper depth of, of a relationship with Jesus Christ where instead of letting go, they will say something similar to what David said, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So his, his burden or for those babes and or for those who are who are saved, not the sinner now, I want the saved to stay saved. Uh, those who have been converted and saved, I need them to continue on. I'm going to read out of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 14th verse, that we henceforth 
listen, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So a lot of his burden had to deal with the deception of those who are in the church. I don't want you to be deceived by what you hear and what you see. I don't want you to be tricked out of your salvation. You need to grow and mature. You need to come to that place now. And he said it one, one time that you, that you are weaned off of milk and you start eating meat. So you have some weight on you. So you're not tossed to and fro with every wind and every doctrine. And I, I have a question here now. Are, are, we, are we concerned really about, about the babes? Are we really concerned uh, about holding on and main, not just maintaining our salvation, but holding on uh, and enduring they that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this is the burden that Paul has. So he's speaking from his heart. He's being completely transparent. I'm concerned about you. I, I don't want you to, to blow away because the wind is going to blow. Uh, there are going to be some spiritual hurricanes that are going to come through. And I'm praying that you are able to hold on. There's going to be some perversions. There's going to be some changings and alterings. And, and remember that song, Saints of God? Uh, some of the seasoned saints could, could probably sing it better than I. Uh, living in the last days, living in the last days, living in the days where men won't mend their ways, calling right wrong, calling wrong right. Surely we're living in the last days where uh, subversion, the subversion of the gospel, uh, the, the turning over of the truth and painting it with, with another color, making it, look, making it look like it is true, but it's not the truth. And he says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying what was going on in the church that Paul should have such a burden. What was going on in the church among the saved folk that gave Paul such a burden to intercede for the people of God in Coloss and in Laodicea. Now, you know the history of Laodicea. He, God had to come back to them and said, I wish you would be either hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. So they were on their way to that lukewarm place, right? And, and Colas was a place that was heavy with philosophy, heavy with uh, sociological ideas. It sounds so good. It makes sense logically, but it's not the gospel. Uh, it's, it's a humanistic approach to life, humanistic, materialistic. Uh, and today we're wrestling with the New Age movement. Uh, it sounds good, it's, it's intellectual, uh, but it's not going to save your soul. Um, so here, the fourth piece of this that we get out of uh, Colossians chapter 2, which is our foundational scripture, uh, from a pastor's heart, uh, he starts dealing with the necessity of the conflict. That's in the fourth verse. Colossians chapter 2, rather, I'm sorry, verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. This is, this is why the Lord is, is dealing with me so much, Paul says, because uh, the enemy is talking some of you out of the truth uh, and bringing false teaching, uh, a false presence, uh, something that sounds right but it's not right and and I'm I've got this burden because I don't want you to be pulled in to something that's going to damage your soul uh, so uh, and so he tells us here in verse 4 while he felt such an urgent uh, such an urgent push uh, to intercede and, and really what he's doing is warfare he, he immediately goes into warfare uh, and saints of God, we got to know who our enemy is. You are not the enemy. We have to stop treating each other like we are the enemy, and we got to go into spiritual warfare. You can't go into spiritual warfare if the army is divided. How are we going to fight? I'm going to say that one more time. 
because somebody needs to hear this. If the army of the Lord is divided, how are we going to fight? So he has this urgency in him to go immediately into, into spiritual warfare for his fellow believers. And this is what we should be doing, praying for the people of God. Praying, pray, the pastor is praying, the missionaries are praying. Everybody who's a, a part of the body of Christ should go into prayer concerning their brothers and sisters, right? And here in verse four, what he's telling us is they're in danger of being pulled away from the truth. I've got this burden, hallelujah. The enemy is busy uh, and, and people are being turned aside, pulled away from the truth. This is, this is why, and I realize Paul is saying, this is why I have this burden. I'm telling you from my heart, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Any man should undermine the truth that has been planted in your heart. Does it happen? Yes, it does. Sadly to say, the Bible says even the very elect will be fooled or tricked or pulled away. And this is why we need to pray. We need to go into warfare. Lord, touch the minds of the people of God. Touch the hearts of the people of God. This is not a game. This is not, don't be like Trump and act like, uh, acting like the virus is nothing. Oh, it'll go away. Listen, this is a real deal. This is the virus of the church is false teaching. The virus of the church are, is the lies that are circulated among the people of God to make them feel like it's all right to let go of certain things. No, it's line upon line, precept upon precept, it's all of the word of God. And he's saying, I don't want you to be beguiled, hallelujah, to be tricked with enticing words. Do such dangers exist today? Yes. I can take you down to verse 8, chapter 2, verse 8. Listen to what Paul says. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy, and this is, this is what was happening to the Colossian congregation, the Colossians, heavy in philosophy, heavy in education. Don't let anybody spoil you, you through philosophy and vain deceit. Listen to what Paul is saying. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ pulling you away from Christ. If it's pulling you away from Christ, it's false. If it's, if it's got you questioning Christ, it's false. If it has you denying Christ, it's false. Do such dangers exist today? You better believe it, yes. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Do such dangers exist in the house of God? Yes, among the people of God? Yes, and the enemy should be arrested. The enemy should be arrested and the people of God should go into that intercessory mode and arrest the enemy, bind up the works of the enemy. I'm talking to the church today from the pastor's heart. Bind up the works of the enemy. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We got to stop fighting one another and go to war against the enemy because the enemy is coming in and he's messing with folks that have itching ears. Seducing spirits have waltzed right in and we're too busy fussing at each other. Paul said, I've got this conflict in myself, this burden. Something has dropped in my spirit concerning you, and I don't want anyone to trick you out of your salvation, so I'm going into war for you. I've never seen you before. Yes, I'm your pastor, but I'm here in the house. But I've got witnesses. I've got, I've got these soldiers, these, these people in here that are supposed to be watching me. They hear me every day crying out, Lord, deliver them. Lord, strengthen them. Lord, give them a mind to stay saved and to hold on to the word of God. They know the word. Don't let the enemy trick them out of 
hallelujah, the word that has been planted in them, hold on to the word. That was his prayer. He's going, and listen, it's a battle. It's warfare. This is war. This is war. Yes, and I know the enemy is fighting. He's fighting in our homes. Yes, he's fighting among, he's got the people of God in an uproar, but somebody's got to intercede. Paul said, I'm struggling. I'm in conflict about you. From a pastor's heart, I'm, I'm in conflict over how the enemy has come in and beguiled some of the people of God. So he's praying for the saints, and this is what we need to do. And I need you to join me as your pastor, as a man of God, to lay on your face, go into warfare. How are you going to rebuke the works of the enemy? Arrest that spirit of division. Arrest that that spirit that is trying to destroy, hallelujah, the people of God. Arrest that spirit that has infiltrated and trying to tear down the things of God. It's time to go to war. Did you hear what I said? Put that in the comment section. Hashtag, it's time to go to war. And it's not against my brother and sister. It's time to fight for one another. Did you hear what I said? It's time for the church to stand up and rebuke the enemy and fight for one another. We will make it. We will be strong. The enemy cannot win if we go to war. There's no weapon that can overcome us if we come together and go to war. Paul said, I'm going to go to war. I'm going to pray. Yes, I am. I don't want any man to beguile you and trick you. The devil is a liar. Hallelujah. Beware. He starts warning them. Beware. Lest any man spoil you through vain philosophy. And vain deceit, I should say, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Hallelujah. So he's dealing with all of this. Some now are confused as to what they believe, right? He's dealing with professing believers, Christians, that, that title that was given to them in Antioch. He's dealing with Christians now and believers now who are, are struggling with faith and struggling with their belief, right? Um, because of all of these cults and false teachings that they're surrounded with and now they're confused. Uh, and listen, I want to tell you the truth. I have sense enough to know that if someone did not engage in spiritual warfare on my behalf, I might not be here right now. I'm going to share my testimony. My father... Uh, would get up every morning about three, three or four o'clock in the morning, like clockwork. He'd come, come out of the bedroom. My bedroom was right across from my parents' room, right? I still remember uh, come out that and about three, four o'clock in the morning, I'd, I'd wake up because I'd hear him open the, the bedroom door and his office was to the left of my bedroom. And I'm laying in my bed and I would hear him crying out to the Lord and praying to the Lord. And I'm, I'm a growing young man. I was mischievous, you know, how boys can be. I was a bad boy. And I didn't know until I became a man. And I'm, I was maybe out on my own doing, you know, I'm preaching now. I'm preaching and, and living for the Lord. But I didn't know until later on that he was on his knees praying for me. He was, I was his burden. I was a big-headed boy doing whatever I felt I was, yes, and, and raised in the church, right? But I, I learned long afterwards, I should say, that he was going into intercession for me. Remember that song? Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. I thank God for that. I thank God for that. It was revealed to me later that he was praying to God for me. I fought the calling. I didn't want to preach. I ran from the Lord. Hallelujah. But somebody prayed and went into warfare on my behalf. My grandmother, uh, when I was, I'd stay over her house, and, and during the night she, she'd come in and put the oil on my head and pray over me. Uh, they were going to warfare on my behalf. We got to know who the enemy is. Hallelujah. Paul was not praying for the sinners this time. He's praying for the saints of God. 
I don't want them to be bamboozled. I don't want them to be pulled out of the house of God because of the temptations of this world, because of the, the false teachings of this world, the false teaching that comes into the church. I want them to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So he's praying. What is Paul praying about? No doubt he's saying, Lord, protect them. Lord, cover them with your blood. Lord, destroy the works of the enemy. These are babes in Christ. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are children. Hallelujah. These are your children. Uh, protect them from the onslaught of the enemy. Lord, you said in your word, when the enemy rushes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise a standard. I'm starting to feel this now. Hallelujah. I don't want them to be moved away from their firm standing. Help them to stand. Hallelujah. Listen, saints, when you pray, don't just pray about yourself. Go into warfare. Yes, rebuke the enemy. He's trying to destroy. He's trying to tear down. And during this time, this pandemic, the saints of God are going through. Many of the saints are shut in. Some are discouraged. Some are dealing with depression. Don't just sit in the house and watch TV. No, turn that TV off and, and get on your knees and pray for the people of God. Pray for their minds. Pray for their hearts. Pray. Hallelujah. Pray that high places will be torn down. Pray. Stand against those principalities. Pray. Hallelujah. Stand against every thought that would raise itself Hallelujah, above the word of God. Tear it down. We got to go into prayer. And this is what Paul is saying, I'm conflicted. Yes, I am. I've got this burden for these people of God. The enemy has waged war against. He's trying to trick them. He's trying to pull them away. He's trying to make them worldly. Trying to get them to compromise. I feel it in my spirit. The enemy is attacking the people of God. I feel it in my spirit. Hallelujah, as a pastor, as a man of God, and as people of God, we've got to be sensitive enough to go into warfare. I don't want my sister to fail. I don't want my brother to fail. Hallelujah, it's time out for he don't like this, I don't like that. No, get on your face and say, Lord, keep us together. Keep us strong. Keep your people strong. Touch her mind and rebuke the spirit of discouragement and depression. Give them peace. You got to go to war. Got to declare war. Listen, I'm sick of the enemy declaring war on us, and we don't do nothing but clap our hands and shout, no, get on your face and call on the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run therein, and they are safe. So we understand now he's got a conflict. He's, I've got a conflict going on. I've got a struggle. I've got a burden, and I'm, I'm going to prayer for you. I'm going to bat. I'm going into to war for you. We talked about the nature. We talked about the intensity of the conflict. We talked about the subjects of this conflict or struggle, the necessity of it. Now let's talk about the purpose of the conflict. And, and he's, he's expressing himself to them, uh, and he's letting us know the purpose of the, the conflict that I'm having. And he's expressing this, and we're dealing with intercession. We're dealing with the fact that the, he's not able to stand in the pulpit, right? So it's not about how good I can preach. It's not about hacking. It's not about putting my hand behind my ear. Hallelujah. And understand, young preacher that's watching me, preaching in the pulpit is only 10% of ministry. And, and don't, don't think that preaching in the pulpit is 100%. He doesn't call me in just to stand in the pulpit and hack and, you know, and do all that. Uh, prayer. I'm going to tell you something Bishop Bonner told me when I first got into D.C. He's talking to me about ministry, and he, before he went to bed, he said these words to me. I had the privilege of staying with him at his house. He said, you have to pray more than you preach. And that thing stuck to my bones to this day. You have to pray more than you preach. Sunday school teacher, you got to pray more than you teach. Choir member, you got to pray more than you sing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, I felt that. I, I'm, listen, I'm in, the, I'm in the sanctuary. I'm getting ready to run around this church and come back and sit in front of this camera. 
You got to pray. And he said those words, and those words sunk into my spirit. You got to pray more than you preach. So Paul is going into warfare. He's dealing with intercession, right? Uh, yes, he is. He's dealing with intercession. Thank you, Jesus. And I feel it in my spirit. Uh, he says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he's praying, Lord, this is what he's interceding for. He's praying a five-part prayer. Those two verses Hallelujah, was, was a lot of meat in that prayer. Sometimes when you pray, you don't have to say a whole lot. God understands I'm standing in between, and this is what Paul's saying, five things in those two verses. Hallelujah, he prayed that they might be blessed in five ways. Are you ready? Encouragement, unity, enrichment. He said, I want them to be established and enlightened. I'll say it again, encouraged united in love there's a whole lot of folks sitting together but there's no love in the room so encouraged united in love enriched established enlightened that they might be encouraged discouragement is the first enemy that attacks especially a babe in Christ especially those of you who may have just gotten saved Discouragement might, is the first enemy that comes. You discourage for several reasons. I can't do it like others. I can't do this. And, uh, you know, anything the enemy might throw you away. Sometimes there's people right in the church that will, might discourage you because you're disappointed now. And you're discouraged. You've got to hold on to God. And this is what Paul, Paul is praying, that they might be encouraged. Second thing he says in those two verses, that they might be united in love united in love united in love there is safety for us in loving and being loved there's safety there if somebody feels loved they feel safe they don't feel love in the midst of all confusion and battering and attacking and all that stuff there's no safety in there i don't feel safe uh if if i'm being attacked if i feel like uh, you know, this, that, and the other. There's a whole lot of things I can put right there. But Paul prayed, so there must, have been, there must have been other issues, deeper issues as well, as far as relationship was going on. Uh, and, and you become easy prey when you don't feel safe. That's why as people of God, we gotta love one another. Yes, we gotta love one another because there's safety in an environment of love. And the enemy can come in if we're bickering amongst ourselves and fighting amongst ourselves. The enemy come right in and pull some lambs out. So he's praying. He's praying that they be encouraged. He's praying that the church be united in love. Thank you, Jesus, because there's safety for us in an atmosphere of love. And he prays that they might be enriched, united in love so that they might have the full riches. Unite them, Father, that they may have the full riches. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Enriched. Let's go to, um, and I have in my notes, I'm trying to make sure I have my notes right, Ephesians 1 and 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I want you to be enriched. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Colossians 2 and 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. 2 Peter 1 and 3, according as his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and to virtue. So this is not the first time Paul has prayed and either, even the other apostles would pray, hallelujah, that they would recognize that God has put in you all that you need to make this journey. 
They would also pray oftentimes that the family of God remain together because when we're divided and the love starts waxing cold and we start fighting one another, then the enemy could come in and take out the lambs right under our noses and go in because we're not praying together. We're not warring against the enemy. We're spending too much time fighting one another, trying to outdo one another, trying to impress this one and that one and Paul. So he starts interceding. I'm, I'm, I'm in my house, my rented house under house arrest, right? And I've got this burden all the way where I am for the saints of God in Laodicea and Colossus. That they would be encouraged, united in love, that they would be enriched, that they may be established, is the fourth one, that they may be established. Thank you, Lord. First Thessalonians, he says here, chapter 1, verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as we know what manner of men we are among you for your sake. So he said the gospel doesn't just come by word, but it comes in power. Power. So you better believe Paul is praying now, Lord, help them to feel that power. Send your power. Send that anointing that destroys every oak. Hallelujah. Let that word that they heard become real in their lives. Hallelujah. Let them remember something that has been planted, something that has been said, something, oh God, that has been spoken. And let the power of the word destroy yokes in their lives. Hebrews 6.11. I feel this thing tonight. My God. Hebrews 6.11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Hallelujah, every one of us. So this, this had to be part of this prayer also, that everyone will see the significance of their salvation, the need to hold on to God and to hold on to one another, to have that mindset that says, I don't want anyone to miss out. Hallelujah, I want anyone to fail. I want everybody in the flock to make it into heaven. And if that means sitting up praying for you, Hallelujah, if I got to pray for you, if I got to call your name out to God, if I got to tell God to help her, tell God to give her strength. Listen, you don't always have to tell people you've been praying for them. Hallelujah, God will put it in your heart. Have you ever gotten up and prayed for somebody, didn't even really know who you were praying for? And there were times where God told me exactly who to pray for. And I didn't know what they were going through. But for some reason, I, he woke me up and I'm calling their name out. Lord, help them. I don't know what's going on with them, but Lord, you put them on my mind for a reason. That's intercession. So, in those two verses, he, he talks to them, uh, talks to the Lord, rather, and he's talking to them, I want you to be encouraged, united, enriched, hallelujah, and established, Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near un with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Lord, do it all over again. Talk that talk to God. Lord, wash them all over again. Touch their mind. If they fall in, help them get back up. Give them the strength they need. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord concerning your brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Talk concerning their healing. Talk concerning their salvation. Talk concerning God keeping their minds. Talk concerning God keeping them with a mindset to live saved. These are the last days and people are walking away. And they need somebody to pray for them. Don't sit up on the phone and talk about them. No, that same mouth that you're using to talk about what they're going through, God said, put the phone down and get on your knees and pray the prayer of intercession. This is what Paul is saying. He must have got word. Some of these folks are backsliding. These folks that have been baptized in Jesus' name, some of these folks are walking away from the truth. And they're mixing this with the gospel, mixing philosophy. He said, don't let anyone spoil you. So he's praying that they be encouraged. Hallelujah. United in love, enriched and established. And also that they would be enlightened. 
Ephesians. I'm going to take you to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding. This is what he prayed for the Ephesians. He said, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding, hallelujah, being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints i'm praying he said i'm praying that you be filled with all the fullness of god i don't want anybody to be lost i have the love of christ in my heart and just like jesus didn't want anyone to be lost i want everything to be all right in your life and i want you to be able to make it through your trials and your tribulations and when the enemy tries to sweet talk you and tries to trick you out of holding on to your joy and holding on to the truth of God's word, I want something to quicken in you. Hallelujah. I want the realness of your salvation. Hallelujah. To manifest something come out of your mouth where you can rebuke the enemy and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This is the kind of prayer we should pray for one another. Keep him. You have no idea what people are going through. You have no idea, hallelujah, the turbulence that's going on in the people of God's minds and hearts. You have no idea what people are being tormented with and troubled with. And they need someone in the body of Christ to cry out to God and go to war for them. And Paul said, I, I'm, there's a war going on in my spirit. He's not talking about what he was going through personally. He's talking about the fight or the conflict or the struggle that he was having concerning what the saints of God were going through. Some of these folks are being tricked, Lord. Some of these people are turning away from the truth. And some of them haven't left the house. They're sitting in the house in a backslidden condition. And Jesus is coming soon. Lord, we got to be ready. You better start praying that prayer. Help us to be ready, Lord. You see all this craziness that's going on in the land? All this stuff that's happening? Listen, Jesus may come before voting day. What if Jesus came before we got a chance to vote for our new president? What if Jesus came before then? Pray, hallelujah, that the saints of God, the minds of the saints will be fastened on God in such a way that no matter what happens, we can say even so now, Come, Lord Jesus. So after he deals with, hallelujah, the purpose of the conflict, right? The purpose was to pray for their encouragement, their, uh, that they would be united in love, that they would be enriched, that they would be established, and that they would be enlightened. He says all of this in these verses here. I'll read them again, then I'll move on. In whom? I'm sorry, verses 2 and 3, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, that's that unity, united in love, and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. Hallelujah. That's enrichment. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. That's that establishment being rooted again in him, coming back to the foundation, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's the enlightenment. Lord, don't let them just sit in the church with the lights out. Help them keep that light on in their mind, that they're forever being transformed by the renewing of their mind. That's a powerful stuff. Two verses, powerful. He says, I got this burden, this conflict. The fellowship of the conflict. And this is the final verse of our foundational uh, scripture. Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. And uh, the fellowship of the conflict is found in the fifth verse. Listen to what Paul writes to the Colossian church. And I'm getting ready to wind down. For though I be absent in the flesh, I'm not able to be there. I'm, I'm in this house. I got soldiers around me. I'm, I'm dealing with this stuff, but it's not stopping me from, from interceding for you. I can't get there to preach on Sunday morning, but you better believe I'm in warfare. I got this conflict. I can't even sleep. 
And the soldiers here can tell you, I'm crying out, Lord, help the people. Lord, strengthen the people. He said, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So Paul is saying, although geographically I can't get in the house with you. If he was, if he was here today, he might say, although because of this pandemic, I can't get in the house with you. I can't call prayer meeting like I used to call prayer meeting. Uh, but you better believe I'm praying in my house. And saints of God, we better be praying in our house. Calling out to God in our house because the saints of God are going through. I don't know who this is for, but this is from a pastor's heart. Paul is crying out, letting them know I'm praying for you. I'm interceding for you. I'm going through myself, but you better believe I've got this burden in my heart for the people of God. He said in Colossae and in Laodicea, and he says in verse 5, but though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Hallelujah. He said, this is a long distance thing. I'm, 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 I'm a bit far from you. I can't get there like I want to. But in, in the spirit, I'm there. I'm praying for you. I'm asking God to deliver and to set free and to give you the strength that you need. I'm by your side. This is what Paul is saying. I'm by your side and I'm watching you like a proud father. Hallelujah. And, and, and he's talking by faith too. And he's, he is expecting God to answer his prayers concerning the people of God. Hallelujah. I'm praying, Lord, and I'm, I'm believing and even expecting a move of God in their lives. Ashama Yesi. Glory. So he's feeling that joy already. And listen, when you pray the prayer of faith and you believe, you're in, you're in that warfare, but you know God is a man of war and you're tearing down strongholds. Even while you're interceding, you feel that joy in your spirit. You feel the joy of the Lord, how knowing that God is moving it even while you're praying. God is sending strength even while you're praying. God is bringing deliverance even while you're praying. And he's praying as though God has already answered the prayer. Hallelujah. So he's saying, although I'm not there, I'm not able to be there physically. I'm there spiritually. And I'm, I'm thanking God. Hallelujah. I've got joy because I see the order. I see God restoring order to your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I, I see God restoring order to your life. I'm talking to you. I don't know your name. But that just dropped in my spirit. I see God restoring order to your life. I see God giving you the strength to stand. Hallelujah. I see God strengthening your faith. I see God making you strong. Hallelujah. Because he's a strong deliverer. He's praying for the saints this time. Lord, help them to hold out. Keep their mind, Lord. Keep them. Keep them. And here's the secret of the conflict. He just came out of the fellowship of the conflict. He said, I'm not able to be there physically, but we're fellowshipping. I'm praying. I see God bringing you out. I see God delivering you. Hallelujah. I see God doing it for you. I see God saving your children. I see God touching your troubled mind. I see God giving you peace. I see God. Hallelujah. Doing it. I see God rebuking the enemy. I see God pushing back the hands of the enemy. I see God doing it for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's take a praise break right now. Thank you, Jesus. Put it in the comment section. Hashtag thank you, Jesus. How I feel a praise right here. I feel a praise right here. Thank you, Jesus. Here is the secret of the conflict. Now we're closing out, people of God. Hallelujah. The question here is who is sufficient? Who is qualified for these things? Who is sufficient? When the Bible says, talks about sufficiency, he's talking about qualification. Who is able? Who is sufficient for these things? How can we be faithful in exercising the ministry of intercession. It's work. It's work. Paul is saying, I'm the pastor, and I want you to know I've got this burden. I'm, 
I'm praying for the people of God. Who, who can be faithful? Or I should say, how can we be faithful in this ministry of intercession and having the sensitivity where we're reaching out to God and praying for others in the body of Christ, others in, in our church family? How, how can we be faithful? And, and the answer, the answer is in First Colossians, I'm sorry, Colossians, the first chapter, verse 29. Colossians, the first chapter, verse 29. It says, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. It's not of you. God will give you the strength. He gives us the strength even to pray for other people. He gives the warrior strength to war. <laughs> Paul said, he said, we're into I'm laboring, I'm striving. He's working. He's interceding. According to his working, God is moving me to pray, and he's moving in this. He's functioning in this. I'm his vessel, and I'm allowing God to work in me through this. It's a battle, but God is working through me which worketh in me mightily, which worketh in me mightily, which worketh in me mightily. Second Corinthians three and five. Second Corinthians three and five. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. Can't really do it of ourselves. I'm gonna tell you the truth because uh, in our flesh, we don't feel like praying. Sometimes in our, in our flesh, we don't even feel like praying for ourselves, to tell the truth. Paul, Paul said, I'm going through my own stuff. Here I am in a rented home. I got soldiers all around me. I don't know. They, might take, they can take me to the guillotine at any time. Somebody can decree and, and put me to death at any time. Anything can happen, but I'm going to pray for you. Yes, I am. Yes, I am, 2 Corinthians 3 and 5. Not that we are sufficient or qualified of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency or our qualification, our ability is of God. So who qualifies? Who is it that has the qualifications? Someone who was born again, someone who has the spirit of God within them, someone who has been moved to step into that intercession for their brother or sister. And Paul said, yes, I'm your pastor. I'm not able to see you, but I've got this conflict. I've got to speak from my heart. Something has been dropped in my heart and I've been calling your names out. I've been interceding on your behalf that you would be enriched, that you would be established, that you would be enlightened, that you would walk in unity of love. Hallelujah that all of these things will happen in your life, that you would not be tossed to and fro with every wind and doctrine, and that you would be encouraged in your hearts, that the enemy would not pull you into a place of despondency and despair, that you would not live in fear alongside those in the world that do not know who God is, that you would not be pushed into a place of pressure so much so that you would give up on God. No. He said, I'm going to pray for you. Hallelujah. I have this conflict. I'm struggling about what you're going through. And God has put it in my spirit as your pastor, as a child of God, as someone who is concerned about the household of faith, that your faith fail you not. And that's my prayer. And listen, we're going to pray. But as we pray this prayer, I don't want you to pray about yourself. I want you to pray about those that you know may be going through. Call their names out in prayer. Even if you'd like to, if you, if you want to tag them now and tell them we're getting ready to pray, Holly, we're getting ready to intercede on your behalf. Yes, you've been on my mind. You've been in my heart. I don't know what you're going through, but I want God to keep you. I want him to establish and to strengthen. I don't know what you've been suffering, but a word just dropped in my spirit. I've been praying ever since your name came into my mind. 
after you've suffered a while, the Lord would strengthen and establish you. Hallelujah. So you can put their names in the comment section, even tag them and tell them, Pastor Fields is getting ready to pray. We're getting ready to pray on your behalf. Lord, help. Lord, deliver. Lord, heal. Lord, touch. Lord, they need peace. Whatever, put their name there and let's intercede. Father, in the name of Jesus, you know all things. I pray, oh God, for their encouragement, that you would establish, that you would bring unity, that you would bring peace in their life. Lord, that you would enrich. Hashamaye. And that you would enlighten. Lord, hallelujah, give them a tenacity to hold on, to endure, not to give up. Hallelujah. Give them the strength that they need, that they would be able to make this journey in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Bind up the works of the enemy in the name of Jesus. And move on their behalf, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, give God a praise right where you are. Give God some praise right where you are. Listen, I'm in the temple all by myself, but I feel the presence of God even now. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the presence of God from a pastor's heart. I want you to be blessed from a pastor's heart. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be united in love. From a pastor's heart, I want you to be established. From a pastor's heart, I want you to be enriched. From a pastor's heart, I want you to be enlightened. I want you to have all the things that God has for you. I want you to make it to see Jesus. Yes, I do. Hallelujah. If you've been blessed uh, by these lessons, if you have been touched by the word of God and uh, you would like to be baptized in Jesus' name, send us uh, that message, Pastor, I want to be baptized and we'll make arrangements for you to be baptized. It doesn't matter where you are, we can make it happen. If you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus, be baptized in Jesus' name. Put that request, admin at grtdc.org. And someone from the staff will get back to you. Yes, you don't have a church home. You want to be a part of this ministry or you need uh, uh, to find a church home. We can help you with that also. Admin at grtdc.org. Yes. And if you'd like to uh, plant a seed in this ministry, you haven't. I've been able to pay your tithes over the weekend. You want to pay your tithes now or plant a seed in this ministry, you may do so. Uh, the technician will put that on the screen for you and you can follow those instructions or you can go right to uh, grtdc.org and uh, you can give right through our website if you'd like to. Those of you who are at our sister church in the New York area in the Bronx, you may use Givelify and you can plant your seed or pay your tithes into the ministry. We want to thank you for your faithfulness to this ministry and for connecting with us every week. Yes, I look forward to it. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but I'm being blessed by the word of the Lord. Three things you know what I'm going to say that I need you to do in between now and if the Lord sees fit to allow us to meet again next week. I want you to be careful. I want you to be prayerful. And yes, be holy. The Lord bless you. We'll see you again soon.